So Israel and Judah are on entirely different paths, and that's kind of what we've seen through First Kings and through the first chapter here of Second Kings. In the southern kingdom, which is on the right here, the kingdom of Judah, there's been stability. We've seen a lengthier rule of Asa. We've seen a fairly lengthy rule of Jehoshaphat. But in the northern kingdom, which is on the left of this side of the chart, uh, we've seen a lot of turmoil, political turmoil and evil and, and, uh, and idolatry and persecution of the prophets of the Lord and that type of stuff. Highlighting that side, obviously Jeroboam won, right? Jeroboam won. I don't have the one there, but it's the first Jeroboam. There's another Jeroboam later. Obviously, Jeroboam, and because he built golden calves and Dan and Bethel and led the people away from the Lord and that type of stuff. But Ahab is another one of those, one of those notorious kings of the north. Well, he dies in battle. His son Ahaziah, you see uh, next, that would be, um, here, I think I can... Ahaziah here, he reigns less than two years. He gets sick, tries to inquire of Baal, Zebub, the god of Ekron. He ultimately dies just as God said he would. And since he has no children, his brother, Joram, Joram's his brother. I'm trying to leave that there. I just, there we go. Joram, uh, Joram becomes king. And Joram is also evil. He's an evil evil oh man how do i get rid of this i forget how to get rid of this there we go how perfect nice you know how to use this i gotta learn how to use this but anyway um in spite of all of jehoram's evil or joram's evil god continues to work and he continues to call his people to repentance and he continues to 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 point them towards the fact that he is the one true god and that baal is nothing so that's a little bit of the political situation well, over the last several decades, Elijah, the prophet, has been a major player. And he's been a mouthpiece of the Lord for several of those kings of Israel. Primarily, we saw him a lot in the life of Ahab, who ruled up until 853, 874 to 853. But now it's time for Elijah to depart from this earth, and it's time for his successor to step up and take his place. Now, if I ever resign... I have to come back to this because, you know, you're kind of dealing with Elijah's successor. We need someone to step up and take his place, you know. But, uh, but here it's, it's a much greater, much greater ministry, a much more powerful ministry uh, than anything that our church ever has and probably ever will see. It's the ministry of the life of Elijah. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, now let me help you remember who's who here. So Elijah came first. Elisha comes second. So I guess the only, there's probably a million ways to kind of think about, you know, how to remember this. But for me, the only thing that I came up with was that J comes before S-H, right? So Elijah, J, comes before Elisha, S-H. So Elijah is first, Elisha is second. Now I'm probably going to miss it. I'm, I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to be messing it up a few times. I'm going to work real hard not to mess it up. But it's not easy saying Elijah and Elisha back and forth. And so I tried to like write it in ways where I wasn't saying them as many times together as I could. And I'll do the best I can, but if I mess up, just, you know, you know, just, you know what I meant. I'm sure you know what I meant if I mess up. But anyway, so the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, all right? And this is Elijah's last day on earth. Now, Elijah and Elisha are at Gilgal, and I think this is probably the best the best map to show you on this. So again, every time I kind of show something like this, I, I kind of like to 
to give you a general feel for where Israel is with my wonderful, my wonderful drawing skills. Now, I don't have the drawing skills that, that Lauren has, you know. So, uh, you know, she has incredible skills. She does like to draw additional wrinkles <laughs> that don't, you know, that aren't a, on a person's face. So just be aware of that. If you ever see any of her works, you know, she draws extra wrinkles that aren't there. But I, I can't draw like Lauren, but, you know, this is my, this is my, this is my map of Israel. It's not, it's not terrible. I think it's pretty good. But if you zoom in, in kind of like the middle of this map, you know, a couple major bodies of water, the, the Sea of Galilee and, and the Jordan River kind of flows from the Sea of Galilee and like a snake path down to, uh, to the Dead Sea. And if you kind of go down towards the Dead Sea, and one of the ways that we always kind of identify where Jerusalem is, if you draw a line straight from the, the, the northern tip of the Dead Sea over to the Mediterranean Sea, which is over here, probably about like a third of the way in or so is about where Jerusalem is. When you go north of that, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the town of Gilgal. So Elijah and Elisha are at Gilgal. And you'll also notice one of the reasons why I like this map is because it's topographical. Now, kids, when I say topographical, that's like a word you're probably like, I'm not really sure what that means. You know what that means, topographical? You know what that means? Probably not, right? But um, what, what it really means, it, it's talking about topography. Did that clear it up? <laughs> no. All right, so, so what that means is, Hey, listen, it's not just the kids. Sometimes the adults don't understand what's in the, right? I mean, sometimes I don't even know what I'm talking about. So don't feel bad. But topography is talking about like elevation. I'm so good at, I'm not great at explaining things to kids. Like, like height, or as my seminary professor used to call it, height. He'd say height. So uh, I'm watching a basketball game today. And this guy, Embiid, who I, I, I'm really, I dislike him. I, I, the more and more I watch him, the more and more I dislike him. He's super tall. He's like seven something. Does anyone know how tall this guy is? Seven four, seven something? He's tall. And then you got this other guy who's like a short guy, right? But he's really good. He's good. Um, well, well, it's like the land right now, we're kind of in the mountains. So we're kind of higher up in elevation. If you were to go down into Lehigh Valley, you're kind of down in the valley, which is lower. Right? So there are mountains. You ever take a hike up a mountain? That's the higher part of the mountain. If you go down into like the bottom of the mountain, we're here, we're still in the mountains, but in other places you might be in the valley. So when you look at this map, what you're going to see is these kind of like yellower sections like in here, those are lower areas. And here's, these are like lower areas. These are called the coastal plains in here. And this is the Jordan River Valley here, which is one of the lowest places on earth as far as height goes uh, when in relation to where the ocean would be. One of the lowest places on earth here, the Jordan River Valley. Well, all this busyness in here, all this stuff in here is mountains. All that stuff's mountains. So that's why I like this map because you could kind of see, you know, the, the yellow stuff is valley, the, the other stuff is referring to mountains. Well, Gilgal, is here in the mountain ranges. It's up in the hill country. And Elijah tells his protege that the Lord is sending him to Bethel, which is also right by Gilgal, which is only about seven miles south of Gilgal. But Bethel's a fairly significant city. Now, why is Bethel a, sign a significant city? Now, first off, it's, a, it's significant because it goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. But why, why recently would Bethel be a significant city? in our more recent context and what we're looking at. What stands out about the town of Bethel, Abbey? I can't remember the name, but one of the guys who made it like a place to give back to the church. Yeah, so what, what Jeroboam I did was he created idols in Dan and the golden calves in Dan and Bethel and said, these are your gods, O Israel, basically, and, and created worship sites for the people to go to, idolatrous worship sites. But here in Bethel, there is, uh, there is apparently, and there, it, this also is up in the mountains, there is apparently a school of prophets there. And these prophets are kind of ministering in the lion's den. 
They're kind of ministering in a place where idolatry has taken place. But in spite of that surrounding idolatry, these prophets have been faithful. And so Elijah wants to go and say goodbye to these prophets on his last day on earth. And he wants to leave Elisha behind in Gilgal. That's kind of what we read in the, in the first verses here. But Elisha's response, when Elijah says, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel, which is only seven miles south of where they start. But Elisha, his protege, says, he's Elijah protege, protege. he says, uh, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Elisha will not leave his master's side. And so the two men travel from Gilgal to Bethel, which is only couple hours away. Look at verses 3 and 4. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Be still. These prophets understand that this is Elijah's last day, but Elisha already knows this. He's been serving under his master for 20 years. Elijah is like a father to him. And so Elisha doesn't even want to think about the fact that this is it. Uh, But again, Elijah tells his protege to stay there while he goes to Jericho. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho, but he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. So you'll notice some of the language that's used here. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Verse 2. Verse 4. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So again, he's, he's determined to stay. He's determined to spend every last minute that he can with Elijah. And some of you know what that's like. Some even more recent, like the Nivell family, understands what that's like. They were determined just a week ago. They were determined to spend every minute they could with Bert. Well, anyway, they go down to Jericho, and Jericho is an 11-mile hike. So if you look here, we're in the hill country here in Bethel. They went from Gilgal to Bethel, and now they're going down to Jericho. And what type of land is Jericho in? Let me help you out. Is Jericho, hey kids, is Jericho in this section of hilly country or is it in this section of valley country? It's a little tough to tell from the map, right? But we're going to go. What's that? Oh, you can look up close there. It's, it's valley. It's valley. But, you know, it could be a little confusing if, if you're not sure. Well, anyway, so it's, it, this, it's, it's an 11-mile hike down. Now, check this out. I'm going to show you um, a slide from... And kids, this is going to display topography, okay? So what you have is, and I'm going to try to see if I could make this happen again. Let's go with pen. Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem is 2,450 feet. I don't know if you could read that or not. The Mount of Olives. So you go down the Kidron Valley and you come back up the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives looks down on Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is 2,600 feet in elevation. Way down here, below the sea level, everything here is below the sea level. Way down there, 700 feet below sea level, is Jericho. Now, this is Jerusalem to Jericho. Bethel is actually 2,900 feet. So when you take 2,900 feet and you add 720 feet, let's see what, you know, carry the one. 
something like that, right? What do, we, what do we have here? We have, oh no! Oh, it came back! It's a miracle! We have, uh, let's try this again. <laughs> we have 3,600 feet, 3,600 feet drop in 11 miles. That's a pretty big drop. Well, this gives you kind of a feel for what's going on here. So these guys, by the way, I was at, uh, I was at Qumran, and at Qumran, there were all the caves. Now, I didn't see the caves, the caves I wanted to see. They were right there, and I didn't see them. I didn't really, I didn't know where they were. I couldn't orient myself. And they didn't really do a good job telling us that they were just outside of sight. Um, I would have taken the walk to see them. But anyway, I wanted to get up into that cave, and you're going up, and, and you're looking down, and you're like, man, that's a drop. Several hundred feet down is a drop. I'm not, if I fall, I'm done. I'm dying. You know, you could die from like a 30-foot fall, from like a 20-foot fall. I think you could die. This is going down 3,600 feet. That's a major, major drop in elevation, and it probably takes them, oh, wait a minute. Huh. There we go. And it probably takes them about three hours to make that trip. So let's come back into the text. So they came to Jericho. Oh, we read it. So they came to Jericho. But if you understand the topography, right, you know they're going down for, into the, a deep valley. Okay. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha. Elisha is older or younger? Is he newer or older? Is he first or second? He's second, which makes him younger, right? Elisha's younger, right? You get a little confusing if you're not paying attention. But the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha, the protege. Protege kids, that's like uh, the student. Protege would be like a student, you know. I, I knew one guy, he was like Einstein protege, you know what I mean? Um, Mike, I think, isn't it? Mike uh, Hobbs. Mike Hobbs. But anyway, uh, the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha, the protege, the, the, the student, and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered again, yes, I know, be still. Like, it's almost like he can't even bear to talk about it. Like, that's how much he loves Elijah and doesn't want Elijah to be gone. And sometimes, listen, we can, we can get that. We can understand that, can't we? You know, sometimes we know, like the Bible says, you know, for... Uh, me to live, Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And sometimes we know that it's a, it's a, it's a better thing for someone to, to, to depart and be with the Lord, but it still doesn't change how hard it is to lose the person. That's kind of what's going on here. And then Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan, to the Jordan River. And Elisha said, does that sound familiar? Does this look familiar? As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So, the two of them went on. The two prophets go on. They leave Jericho. They walk another five miles from Jericho to the Jordan River. Uh, that's all inside of the Jordan River Valley, and there's a crowd of prophets watching from a distance in verses 7 and 8. Uh, now, 50 men of the, prophet, of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan, the Jordan River. Elijah, who is the older guy, right? He's, he's the one that came first. Elijah took his mantle. What's a mantle? Go ahead, buddy. A type of bucket? Is that what you said? Type of bucket? Hmm. If it is, that's news to me. <laughs> but a mantle is a guy who hits 500 some homers for the Yankees, right? That's what a mantle is. But for most people, a mantle would be something like over the fireplace, right? So Elijah takes his mantle from over the fireplace. No, it's a cloak. It's a mantle is a cloak in this context, okay? It's a cloak. Uh, so Elijah takes his, it's like a coat, his like cloak. Uh, he takes, it, uh, maybe fairly similar to the little cloak that was drawn on my back on the, 
on the, you know, John, I heard what happened there. I heard you said, make sure you draw a cape and make sure it's small. <laughs> Is that truth? She was telling the truth. She ratted you out. All right. Anyway, so Elijah takes his cloak and folded it together and struck the waters of the Jordan and they were divided here and there. So the waters divided up, just like what happened at the Red Sea, just like what happened with Joshua when Joshua brought the people of Israel into uh, the promised land when the Ark of the Covenant came in and the waters dried up and they all crossed over and then the Ark of the Covenant came out and then the water, right? It was the same thing. The waters divide here and there. Now listen, you've never seen that. I've never seen it. Anyone here see water just stand up on two sides? And you know, that, no, that doesn't happen. Maybe some Pentecostals might claim it still happens. It doesn't happen. So he strikes the waters that were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now, I just want to show you real quick, the, uh, the Jordan River today is not quite as raging as it was in Bible times. Here is a traditional site of Jesus' baptism at Bethany beyond the Jordan. Now, this is kind of like a little side tributary of the area. This is, this is actually, this is a really small portion of, of the river or at least a tributary of it. And here's a little bit more like what it would look like, uh, what it looks like today down near the Dead Sea. Just a couple of these. I mean, you see how it's like, it's like a snake. I mean, that's how most rivers are. You know, it's a, it snakes down through an area. And, um, and so this is only just a few miles south. You could actually see on this picture, if you look up to the top, you can kind of see the, 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 the tip of the Dead Sea, the northern tip of the Dead Sea. So this is just a few miles south if you were to look at a map and we're assuming that they're somewhere in here, they're, this, these pictures are just a few miles away. So that gives you a general feel for about what the Jordan River might look like in that general, in that general area. Well, anyway, Elijah takes up his mantle, his cloak, he strikes the Jordan, the waters are dried up, the two men cross over on dry ground, and uh, it's, basically, it's basically like a reversal of what happened when the people of Israel came into the Promised Land. Because if you remember, when the people came in under the time of Joshua, they crossed over the Jordan River, they went to Jericho and took the city of Jericho. Then from there, they went to Bethel and Gilgal. Well, here, it's just, it's just, it's just the exact opposite. They're, just doing, they're doing the same trek that Israel took on the way into the Promised Land. They're doing the same trek at the end of Elijah's life, which I thought was kind of interesting. But anyway, they cross the Jordan and Elijah asks his student a most important question. And, uh, and I might say to you, well, you know, let's, let's look at the question first. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. Ask for anything you want. Anything you want. Now, I'm sure there's a realistic aspect to this. But let's take that realistic aspect out of this for a second. What if I said to you, ask for anything you want, and it's yours? What would you pick? I know what most people would pick. What well, most people, I mean, there's a few things. Most people might pick health or long life or something like that or long life for them and for their family. But a lot of people, the first thought that came into your mind, you know what it was. What was it? For most of you, for some of you, Probably, at least it came into your mind, right? At least it came into your mind. Man, wouldn't it be nice to have like, you know, $20 million, you know? Oh, is, is 20 million, it's not what it used to be, you know? Uh, so, you know, I don't know, I don't know what that is in today's market. In, in, in the 80s, I don't know what that is versus today's market. I think under the Biden economy, in the Trump economy, 20 million was 20 million. I think under the Biden economy, it's, it's more like $10, so, but, uh, but nevertheless, it's not, it's not what it used to be. Okay, let's put it that way. But, you, but if I said anything you want, you're probably lying if money didn't pop in somewhere. 
riches, great riches. I could do anything I want. I could go anywhere. I could eat steak and lobster for my birthday. I could eat so much steak and lobster, it's coming out of my ears, right? If I had money. George Bailey wanted money, and it's a wonderful life. And then Potter stole it from him and got away with it. He got away with it. Can you imagine Potter got away with it? But anyway, that's another day, another story for another day. Well, anyway, you ask him, well, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. You know, he could ask for anything. Doesn't necessarily mean he's going to get it, but he could ask for anything. He could ask for any possession he wants, anything his heart desires, riches, fame, whatever. He is dealing with a prophet of the Lord who can pray to the Lord and he could ask for anything. What would you ask for? Notice, and for some people it would be love, right? Love, but not just like a wife. It's got to be the fairy tale, you know, because people aren't realistic. They watch too much Disney. You know, it's got to be the fairy tale. It's got to be the knight in shining armor or something like that. Elisha, Elisha can ask for anything he wants, and notice what he asks for in verse 9. And Elisha said, please... Let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Now, what in the name of Sam Hill does that mean? What is a double portion of Elijah's spirit? I remember, most of you guys should know this because I've talked about this. I've talked about this quite a bit. But for some of the newer people, if I ask you guys, Manny and Charlene, if I ask you guys, what's a double portion? What's that mean? Would you know? I'm like, oh, I got some guesses. And I'm not 100% sure. If I ask the young people, if I ask some people that have been around, you probably know the answer. There's, there's this guy here. He used to come here, and he used to always pray. Every time he'd pray for me, he'd say, uh, I pray that you give him a double portion of thy, of thy spirit. I pray that thou wouldst give him a double portion of thy spirit or something like that. He'd always pray for me that way. And every time I heard that prayer, I, I knew he didn't understand what that meant. And so I tried to, like, help him, like, understand. I tried to teach him that truth, both publicly and privately. And if he, if he, he probably would have understood that truth if he, if it wasn't, if he didn't sleep so much during the, during the sermons. <laughs> and this guy snored, too, man. I was just looking through my, you, you know, you have those one drives, like you're this, on this day, this happened. Well, just like the other day, I opened up on this day and there was a picture of him sleeping. <laughs> and someone took a picture of him sleeping at like a, at like a conference. His mouth is open, it's, this guy. But anyway, he always prayed for, a, you know, let, 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 him, let a double portion of your spirit be up, upon him. Um, but if you want to understand what this means, you have to understand the context of the day. Listen to what God wrote in the Law of Moses. Uh, so here you have a context of someone kind of taking, uh, in, in a scenario where there would have been multiple wives, not something that God would have, would have approved of, but in certain cases a brother would end up taking his brother's uh, widow, his brother died, and then raise up children in his name, some of that stuff. Uh, so you did have certain precedent for that at, at some level. But, but anyway, uh, he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved wife, in a, in, a, in a case where a guy took on a second wife and, 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 and the, he favored his other kids or whatever else. He shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has. So, so the firstborn would receive a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn. So, so what happens is this. Let's just say you had three kids. Let's just say you had three sons. You would divide everything up by four parts. So you'd give the first son two parts, you'd give the second son a part, and you'd give the third son a part. That's how it would work. And the first son was getting two parts, not because he was favored, but because his role was supposed to be to carry on the work of his father. So he was the one who would then kind of be responsible for the family. He would kind of become the patriarchal leader of the family, and he would have that double portion to help him carry out that role and to carry on his father's work. That's what this is all about. So now, so now let's come back and let's look at the request. 
Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What's he asking for? What's he asking for? Many. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, ben. I don't know quite that. I would say probably not, not so much. Not so, not so so good as, not so eloquently put as, you know, uh, go ahead. <laughs> really, he's asking. And so, you know, obviously those are parts. So those are going to be parts. I mean, if you're a prophet, the Holy Spirit's going to be involved at some level. And leadership's going to be involved at some level. But what he's really asking for here is to... to to carry on the ministry of Elijah. I want to take up, metaphorically speaking, I want to take up Elijah's mantle, and I want to continue his work. I want to continue his prophetic ministry. Which, so that's why I say leadership. I'm like, you could see, technically, yes. But that's only as an implication of what he's really asking for. You know what I mean? And oftentimes, those prophets, they're, I mean, they end up being prisoners, they end up being beaten, killed, so, you know, whatever. He's, he wants to take up Eli, he wants to take Elijah's place and devote his life to Elijah's work. What we're seeing here throughout this passage is commitment. What we're seeing here is faithfulness. He will not leave Elijah's side, and when Elijah's gone, he wants to carry on Elijah's work. That's what he's asking for. So can you see why it would be strange for me when someone says, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon him? I'm like, man, it just doesn't. So does that mean like Holy Spirit X2? You know, like times two? I don't really know what that prayer request means. You know what I mean? Is it, is you, Joe, you understand why that would be a kind of a strange on my... I, I, I think it was, a, it, was a, it was trying to say something positive. He was trying to say, hey, you know, guide him, lead him, whatever. But it just, I could never really get past the particulars of the language. Like, that's not really has anything to do with what this is about. So um, I, am I supposed to pick up and carry on, you know, God's minute? I don't know. Maybe that's what he meant. I, maybe, I don't know. But uh, what I'm seeing here is devotion. What I'm seeing here is commitment. What I'm seeing here is Elisha wanting to carry on Elijah's ministry and look at Elijah's answer to his student. Elijah, he said, you have asked a hard thing. All right. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. In other words, you put it into the common vernacular. You put it into the language of the people. What's he saying? You paraphrase it. What's Elijah saying? What's his answer? It's not really my decision, right? It's God's decision. And so if you see me taken up, then so be it. And if you don't see me, then God is not allowing this to be the case. We're leaving it in God's hands, in God's unchanging hand. Anyway, the two prophets walk along the other side of the Jordan River, and then the miraculous event takes place. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven, which must have been some experience, right? Um, the divine army separates the two prophets. God takes up his prophet Elijah into the heavens. Which, by the way, in the ancient mind, the, the mind of the ancients would have seen them going to the place of the dead, like the underworld. And here, you're like really kind of discrediting the whole thinking that the ancient mindset had. Elijah's going up into the heavens. And, uh, you know, you kind of have a, an interesting parallel here because several times recently, fire had come down from heaven to deliver Elijah, and now chariots of fire. I was going to have the sound guys play like chariots of fire as I read that portion. <laughs> you should put the mic on for that so it could have. That was nice work, by the way. Um, 
I'm not even sure. That was from a movie, right? Is that from a movie, or is that just like a song that was written? It's a movie. That's a movie? What's it about? Well, is it about Elijah? No. Is it like about Ben-Hur or somebody like that? I don't know. What, what, what is it? I lost my poor meatball? Oh, yes, it's the Italian version, yeah. Yes, of course. That's the only one you would know, of course. The Italian version. So anyway, so the, fire had delivered him, and now chariots of fire came down to escort him to paradise. It is really a glorious moment in history. And we won't see Elijah again on this earth until, you tell me when, when's the next time we see Elijah on earth? After this. The Mount of Transfiguration. Right, exactly. When he met with Jesus. Yeah. So, Elisha, does he see his shadow? You know, <laughs> or whatever. It's like every groundhog day. Did, did, did the groundhog see? Did Punxsutawney Phil? Does Elisha see it? Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father. The chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He saw the entire event take place with his own two eyes. Thus, he has received the double portion. He's going to carry on the work. And he takes up Elijah's mantle, metaphorically and actually, literally, in verse 13, he took up the mantle of Elijah, the, the cloak that fell from him, and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan, and he took the mantle of Elijah the, the, the had, that fell from him. <laughs> Second time we see that same language. It fell from him. You know, he went up the sky and the cloak fell, and Eli, Elisha took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? The Lord is my God. Elisha's name is similar, my God saves. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had we he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. So Elisha, just like Joshua and Elijah before him, parts the waters of the Jordan joining a group, a small group of people who have parted waters in human history, which only includes one other person that I can remember. If I'm missing it, I might be missing someone, but I don't think I am off the top of my head. There's only one other guy. Who's the other guy? I mean, obviously God does all of it, but who's the other guy? Elijah, Elisha, Joshua, and Moses. But it wasn't the Jordan River. It was, it was the Red Sea, yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, the prophets look on in amazement, and they recognize that uh, Elijah has, Elisha has taken Elijah's place. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They recognize it right away. He's taken up the mantle. He's taking up his ministry. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. But they're not completely convinced that Elijah is gone. Because they didn't see it. And so they want to go search for him. And Elisha's like, come on. You know what I mean? Like, really? They said to him, behold now, there are with your servants 50 strong men. Last time we saw a group of 50, what happened to those guys? They went searching for Elijah. And, uh, you know, well, technically the last group made it, but the two groups before that, uh, not, not so much. But anyway, uh, there are with your servants 50 strong men. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. And he said, he went like this. <laughs> you shall not say, you shall not pass. You know, something like that, right? Uh, it doesn't allow him, you're wasting your time. You know, uh, but the, these prophets, 
they just don't give up. You know, it's, it's kind of like me when I want something, I don't give up. You know, like my, I'll ask my wife, I'll, I don't have to ask permission, but you know, sometimes it's good, it's good thing to kind of like, you know, at least, you know, talk about it at some level. And you get like, I don't really want to do that. And then, you, you know, you come back and you ask again and you come back and you kind of make another argument. You come back and you say, you know, you just keep, I just, I don't give up. I don't give up. It's like if, I, if, 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 I, if there's a company and, and, and they've done me wrong, I don't give up until I get what I want. Okay, or I'll tell them I'm just going to leave your company. I'll just go to another company. So I don't give up. She'll be on the phone with someone, and she'll be like, they're not going to do anything about it. I'm like, give, me, give me the phone. <laughs> I take the phone, and by the time I'm off that phone, I've done everything I could. Only a couple times in my life do I, you know, you don't get it. And you're just like, okay, well, then I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to go to another company. You force my hand. Well, that's how these prophets are. These prophets don't give up. All right? It's not always a good quality, but sometimes it's a good quality. But anyway, uh, but when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent their 450 men, and they searched three days, but did not find him. Now, Elisha knows where Elijah is. Where is Elijah? What happened to Elijah? He got taken to heaven in a whirlwind, right? So he's not there. He got taken up. But he satisfies the... Look, if you want to do it, it's kind of like what happened with, like, with my, my wife and I when we had our first dog, you know. Remember that dog, Rookie? You remember Rookie? We had him for a week. Went to the pound, saw this dog, big dog, big dog. He was like, I don't know, something like that, right? I don't want a big dog. And, you know, she's like, oh, he's so cute. Oh, oh, look at him. I'm like, that's not a cute dog. That dog will bite your head off, you know. So, oh, it's so cute. And then I saw him go to the bathroom, and I was like, Roxanne, look at that. <laughs> look at it! You're going to have to clean that! And, uh, but she, she didn't want to listen, and so I said, okay, I'm going to let you learn your lesson the hard way. <laughs> and a week later, I ripped him by the collar, threw him into the... <laughs> threw him into the cage and took him away because <laughs> that was, we learned our lesson. We, you didn't want that dog after a week. You wanted him gone, right? Agreed? So I was right about it right from the beginning. So Elisha knows. He knows what's up, but he wants that, you know, okay, you know what? If you want to learn, <laughs> you want to learn. Now listen, sometimes I have to learn the hard way. Don't we have to learn? Don't we all have to learn the hard way sometimes? We all do. Most of us do. These guys have to learn the hard way. So Elisha says, go ahead, go ahead, search. Search all you want. See if you find him. They returned to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? In other words, I told you not to go over there, right? I told you so. Right? It was a, I mean, who, who doesn't love to say I told Who doesn't love it? Who doesn't love? Who here doesn't love to say I told you so? If, even if you don't say it out loud in your heart, you know you love it, right? Well, Elisha does too, because he's a human. He's a sinner just like we all are, and he's got a human nature just like we all do. And now, anyway, that's, the circle is now complete. Elisha has taken Elijah's place, and he has a double portion of Elijah's spirit. In today's passage, God takes one of his faithful prophets home. He rewards Elijah by taking him to heaven in a whirlwind, but we also see the faithfulness of his student, of his protege, Elisha. Elisha would not turn aside from to the right hand or to the left. He wanted to take up his master's mantle. He wanted to take up the risks of being a prophet. He wanted the rights and responsibilities of being a prophet. He wanted everything that went along with giving God's message to some of these evil kings of the north. He wanted to take up that charge. That's what this is. That's, that's what, from a human perspective, that's what we're seeing here. Now, we, we may not be taken up into heaven in a whirlwind like Elijah was. That's not going to happen. You're all going to die unless Jesus comes back first. 
We know that God keeps his promises to us. We know that he will give us everlasting life if we place our faith in Christ. Uh, We know that we'll spend eternity in paradise. But in order for that gospel message to continue from a human perspective, we need people like Elisha. We need people who are willing to take up the work of the ministry. We need men who are willing to commit their lives to the Lord's work. And that's a rare thing today because, you know, good seminaries are closing. When I, my first year in seminary, there was like, I can't even tell you, the, there was like a, you know how we have these little boxes over here for the, for the mail? Nobody uses them, but we have like, a, like a, a thing with like a bunch of different boxes. Like this one belongs to the treasurer and this one belongs to, you know, whoever, the, the, the pastor. I have one. I haven't checked it in months. So every once in a while I look at, like, peek in there. But people kind of know we don't do that anymore. I throw my bills on Mr. Metcalf's Bible and, you know, they, people hand me my stuff and whatever else. My first year in seminary, there was a big old thing and it was, it probably went from like here and it probably came, I'm just, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while. I got to think something like this. And I got to think it's something like, like this size. And I feel like my first year in seminary, they were almost like loaded up. By the time I left, they were almost empty. People weren't, you can't, you can't get people to go into ministry today. You can't get them to go in. And the ones that do go in don't want to be qualified. They don't want to put in the work. They want to skip. They want to go see somebody in Philly and say, hey, give me a church somewhere. Now, maybe God hasn't called you to lead. I get that. But he has called you to spread his truth. And we need people like that as well. Yeah, we need, we need people who are willing to take up the work of the ministry But we need people who are willing to give the gospel, people who are willing to do whatever is necessary to spread his gospel, people who will dedicate their lives to it, people who are willing to suffer the consequences of taking the risk of giving someone the gospel, regardless of what they might say or what they might think about you. Are you willing to take up the mantle, metaphorically speaking? Are you willing to devote your life to the work of the Lord like Elisha was? If you can't do it in full-time vocational ministry, are you willing to devote your life to spreading his gospel? Would you be willing to receive the double portion? Let's take our hymnals and turn to 386. We're going to close our service with it within him. Uh, If you're...